serving boards. Basically just a cutting board with handles, but we can call it something different. So this video, it's just gonna walk you through some of the steps to batch out uh, serving boards like this, right? To be efficient with your time. Uh, also some notes on sales. So if you are into the side hustle, uh, small business, some tips on, on sales. I've actually sold quite a few of these. Uh, they do make a lot of money. Uh, these boards right here are all gonna be face grain, right? So face grain, I'll talk more about that. It's a great way to really, you know, capitalize on some gorgeous grain, you know, some quilted maple, some of this feathering, some figured woods. Also, it's great for scraps as well. If you're looking for a full video on cutting boards, I've got one, Cutting Board 101. Uh, lots of things for, for glue ups, but also for, for the thicker boards, for edge grain, um, you know, a video on end grain, all that kind of stuff. But you're here for serving boards. So serving boards, you got the handle, you got breakfast in bed, you got charcuterie, uh, you know, dessert tray, all kinds of stuff. They really are versatile and it just is another piece. So uh, use those timestamps down below to skip around uh, to whatever you're looking for or sit tight for the, the whole shebang. And um, here you go, serving boards. So first up, go ahead and pick your wood species. So got a whole video on all kinds of different wood. I'll talk more about wood later in the video, but got your wood species, got your good stock. And then I like to go ahead and cut everything to size lengthwise. And so just doing some rough cut here at the miter saw. I like to go for a board that's just under 24 inches. Uh, really, I wouldn't go much longer than that. I do like to cut my pieces a little bit longer just to help uh, account for snipe and glue up. So around 26 inches, obviously that's not gonna fully account for snipe. More about snipe later in the video. But um, go ahead and I cut my pieces to length. So I also have some here that are a little bit shorter uh, just because some of the material I had was shorter. But you cut it to length and then you wanna go ahead and rip it. So this is a beginner woodworker tip. Uh, just make sure that you're using a ripping blade, not a cross cutting blade like this. More teeth, it's more for the cross cuts. Ripping blade uh, is really, really important for the big rips. Make sure you got that riving knife, all those normal, normal things. But here, just showing a dovetail bit, uh, how I was able to cut these grooves and use these match fit clamps to make a jig. If you have your own joiner, you could skip ahead, you don't need this, but uh, a joiner to joint the wood is really important, all right? You wanna have a flat surface to work off of, uh, especially here, you can see with this Bolivian rosewood, uh, just how twisted it is, and I just don't have a flat face. So if I ran this through the fence right now, uh, I wouldn't get, you know, I'd waste a lot of material, it would be some issues. So here I can clamp down my piece, and then I can get a straight cut, and that way I have one surface, one side to work off of, then I can just then use it on the fence uh, with no issue. And so of course a joiner would be a great tool, but most people can't justify the space in a small shop, especially for hobbyists. So great little jig. And then you can see they're all clean, right? So nice and flat there on the bottom, good to go. All right, right now I'm marking the, the growth rings, kind of the orientation of the wood, just to show you a little bit about wood movement. So here's a quick note on wood movement. All right, real quick, I'm gonna stop, and I wanna talk a little bit about wood movement. Use those timestamps, skip ahead if you don't care, but this is a little bit of a word of caution. I said these are all face grain boards, right? Face grain, so you take your wood, and there's, there's the face grain, right? The face of the board. Uh, flip it on its edge, that's edge grain. Different names for it, all like long grain, all that. So especially on this Wenge here, you can see this is beautiful. I really like uh, the pattern here. This is the look I'm going for. I flip it on its edge, the edge grain looks different. There's nothing wrong with it, I love it. There's just a different pattern. And so sometimes as we're building these boards, we see a really cool pattern like, oh, well this looks, you know, oh, I like this side better. Oh, there's better figuring here and we alternate it. Well, then sometimes you run into the issue of having extra wood movement. And so you saw how I marked out those boards with a chalk, right? You could see on the end grain, some are like, you know, this way, that way. And the thing is, if I sandwich all those boards together, different species, first off, right? Different species, different humidity, moisture levels. And if they're all facing in different directions, as this wood moves, because wood moves throughout the seasons, as it expands, contracts, right? Um, it sometimes it's gonna it's gonna move this way, right? So maybe it's gonna rise up. And if I have a board next to it that goes this way and it goes right, then they can compete. So it is something to take into consideration as you're putting the boards together. 
in the last couple of years, there have been actually a lot of videos, YouTube videos, that like say that's a myth, and they kind of dispel that. Uh, other woodworkers will say that they've never had the issue. Traditionally in woodworking, they say, right, you want to alternate and flip the grain direction to, to minimize movement. It, it is something you could just take, you know, roll the dice, you know, take the risk for it. I will say that a lot of times, especially with my super thin rips, I mean, this one is less than an eighth of an inch, right? I don't do face grain all throughout. So I usually, on these serving boards, I do all face grain. Then I do sometimes have some edge grain rips in there. And sometimes uh, I take that chance. But I understand that there is a chance my board might fail. Anytime I'm making a new project, if I'm planning to sell it, I usually try and make that style and wait at least a year and give it to friends and family and see how it holds up. See how it holds up over time so that way I can feel confident before you know releasing it to the public. If I'm gonna rush that, or even after the fact, I just have to be prepared. If something goes wrong and it's my fault because I didn't account for how I made the board, I'm gonna have to take care of that, whether replacing the board or doing a refund. So take that into consideration, especially take that into consideration if you're gonna sell these to different parts of the country or the world that have different moisture levels, right? If you're in a place that's not, that's super dry and then it's going someplace that's super humid, that could be a potential, you know, whoopsie daisy. So things to consider, not to scare you and make you not want to do it. But like with any project, you know, I do recommend maybe, maybe test it out first, have some personal projects. I have a ton of personal projects that are still holding up just fine, but, but you learn, uh, you live and learn. So anyway, face grain, beautiful, edge grain, beautiful, end grain, it's all beautiful. Just some things to consider. Enough of the blab, back into the project, batching out some serving boards. So with that being said, go ahead and jump in and take a look at your stock. So you do want to go ahead and group your pieces that are the same thickness so you're not wasting material. So here I have quite a few pieces that are about four quarter or one inch thick. And so I want to make sure that I, I'm keeping those together, uh, not mixing them. But here you can see that gorgeous face grain, right? Check that out. This is why you love to do face grain boards. Uh, but here you can see that these are all about the same thickness. They're pretty uniform, so that, that's going to be great for a glue-up. Um, you know, a lot of times if you go to hardwood dealers, you're going to find wood that's, that's a little bit thinner, uh, maybe 7 eighths of an inch uh, or 3 quarters of an inch sometime, especially those exotics. And so it would be a shame to just use that 3 quarter inch with a 1 inch. You're going to lose so much of that material. So that's just something that I'm doing here just to account for it. But uh, once you've done that, go ahead and start ripping. So again, that ripping blade, it just makes things easier. You're still going to probably have marks. You're going to have to clean up later. But I'm just ripping everything down uh, to, to different dimensions. And so, you know, you get some practice over time figuring out your patterns, what you want to go for. So I have some uh, thick, some wide. I'll talk a little bit more about patterns in a second. But just make sure you got a good push stick. You're uh, ripping it through. And then just start experimenting with the patterns and kind of get a feel for uh, what you want. Uh, once you've got the, the first cut, those thicker ones, I like to start doing some thinner ones, right? To start adding some more contrast, some more patterns. Then the thin rips. Now what I'm doing right here, word of caution, I've been doing this a lot. I know what I'm doing. I'm being safe. Do not try this at home, all right? I usually use a micro jig. I, it's broken. I'm trying to replace it. Got to do that. But I did this. I've done it before. But this really is where the table saw accidents happen. So make sure you have a good system for ripping those thin pieces. Uh, there's other uh, options for that, but be safe. All right, once I have all my pieces, uh, you know, cut to, to the different widths, you can see I have a lot of uh, variation there. And I can start building my patterns. And so uh, I got some uh, various sizes, right? I kept a couple of those bigger pieces that face grain really stands out, but then uh, adding the contrast, at least for this pattern, you could certainly just skip the whole pattern thing altogether and just go with a single species to do this project. Just skip on ahead with those timestamps if you want to do that. Uh, but here you can just see my process for gluing up face grain boards. Um, I am using a drum sander here. You do not need a drum sander for this project. I have it though, so I'm using it. Really, you just want to clean up the sides. In my cutting board 101 video, I talk about, I, I talk a lot more about this. I go more in depth about why you want to remove any saw marks, make sure you have a uniform surface. But you really can get away with this, uh, you know, with just minimal sanding or using a hand plane. But these thin rips, the super thin ones that are like an eighth inch thick or even less, really no way around that other than with the, the drum sander. All right, glue up time. So I just use pipe clamps or parallel clamps. Throw some tape down to, to make sure you don't have a big mess and have to clean up your clamps later. 
And then I like to use Type Bond 3. It is a water resistant glue. Uh, well, Type Bond 2 would be fine, but Type Bond 3 glue is a great wood choice. And here with my setup, I can actually glue up two at the same time. And so I have two different boards. Just make sure that you don't have glue in between the two pieces and you don't glue them together accidentally. And uh, once I've glued them all up, I got lots of glue. Don't, you know, don't skimp on the glue. I like to use calls. Here I'm using melamine. Usually I would use, you know, scrap wood, some hardwood covered with, you know, packing tape or sheathing tape. Melamine works, you just don't want to over tighten or there's going to snap on you. But calls are just going to keep everything uniform and flat so you don't waste too much material when you flatten it later. Uh, make sure with the clamps you have pressure on the top and bottom unless you're using parallel clamps. So you don't need to go overboard with the clamping pressure, just enough to get a good squeeze out. And so here you can see if you're getting the glue coming out down below, making sure it's everywhere you need, uh, but you don't need to kill it. You see those calls underneath, it's keeping everything relatively flat. So uh, scrap wood, two by fours, thin pieces, just covered in tape, that works great. All right, I am adding some CA glue. There's some Starbond CA glue and activator just to fill some knot holes. I'll talk a little bit more about this later in the video, uh, but just a quick little tip that happens. So after you glued it up, pull it out of the clamps, but then you got a mess. You got all of these glue dots that have hardened and you need to clean that up. So usually I like to leave uh, my board in there for you know at least four to six hours. Then I can scrape off those dots. So just with a paint scraper, you get it at Home Depot or a box store. And um, that way you have a surface that can run through the planer or for surfacing. But here you can get a feel uh, for how the pieces look, but they need to get flattened. So, um, you know, gorgeous, right? They're relatively flat. Those calls really help uh, keep a, a good glue up. But flattening options. You could just use a belt sander and that's gonna take you some time. Uh, if you had a you know higher power orbital sander, you could do that as well. Those are two options for those who don't. You could uh, have the big tools. You could also do a router sled. There I pointed to my plunge router. Here I, I've flattened boards before using a router sled. I have some other videos that talks more about that. But really the planer is the best option for flattening boards. You could use a drum sander, uh, but I really recommend the planer. It's great. I talk a little bit about the difference in those tools in, in another video, video uh, drum sander versus planer. But the planer is great. And so I'm just sending these boards through, um, just taking small bites at a time to get it flat and get rid of all the glue, get it nice and flat. Uh, so because I scraped off the paint below, uh, I'm, I'm, not the paint, use the paint scraper to scrape off the glue dots. Uh, it can just run through nice and easy. Uh, you do wanna account for snipe. Like I said, that cutting board 101 video goes a lot more in depth as far as snipe. What is snipe? It's when it dips into the wood and uh, kind of, you know, kind of ruins your board a little bit. Uh, but here, if I just have constant movement, constantly moving them through, uh, I don't get too much snipe uh, with this process. Uh, they're really clean, right? This is just coming out of the planer. Uh, really, really clean boards. They, they turned out rather nicely. Uh, but here you can see, I did leave some of those ends on the end. Uh, that's just, you know, when it runs through the planer, the snipe's gonna go on the end, not my actual piece. All right, time to square off my boards. So uh, just using a miter gauge, I'm just gonna throw down some melamine scrap wood just to have a cleaner cut. You just wanna attach that to your miter gauge. But notice how it's backwards. So a backwards miter gauge is actually great. Uh, you don't have to use a crosscut sled or anything like that to, to move a bigger board or that wide piece through the table saw to square it off. So there I'm able to square off one side, take a look on the other side and kind of decide where do I want to cut it? How long do I want my final board? Maybe I had some snipe. Uh, maybe I had some you know glue, uh, glue up mishaps. And so just go ahead and cut yours to, to final length there. You could certainly use a sled uh, just make sure you're using a gauge, a minor gauge or a sled of sorts. But there they are all squared up. They're looking nice, some beautiful boards, some great patterns, uh, some great species. Time for the edge treatment. So I like to do a chamfer. Uh, chamfer, it's just a 45 degree bevel. You could do a round over, you could do whatever edge profile you'd like. Uh, but just a nice slight chamfer I think is a good look for these and that's usually what I go for. So just a simple, simple router table here will we'll do the trick and uh, can make quick work of it. You of course could use a trim router to add the profile here as well. And there you go. You can see that, that nice little modern vibes with uh, the chamfer. Uh, it's a nice, nice look, that, that chamfer. 
All right, so for the handle jig, uh, here I just have a piece that's one inch in, one inch in, and then it's just five inches wide. And then my handles that I go with have a three inch uh, spacing. You could definitely buy something like this. I know Craig uh, makes their own, you know, cabinet drill bit jig, uh, but making your own is kind of fun too. Pretty simple, so I'm just taking two pieces of plywood, scrap wood, uh, just going in about an inch in, so I want my handle to set in about an inch, and then if I have a five inch piece, one inch from either side, that's about three inches in between, and then once I've marked it, I go ahead and drill it. You do not need to use a drill press for this, it's just nice, I have it, so I'm gonna go for a 90 degree Drill, uh, you don't have to have the drill press. You could use a, a hand drill here, uh, a power drill. But I'm going ahead and I'm drilling the holes for uh, my alignment. Then I'm just using some CA glue. The CA glue is amazing, right? It's super glue, use it to fill void holes, use it for jigs. So I add it, got a little spacer there to help with alignment. And then using the accelerator, the activator, it's gonna make that CA glue, that super glue, you know, glue almost instantaneously. Uh, just a couple seconds so align it quick get it down and uh, just add some pressure and there you go you got yourself uh, a jig that can work for alignment getting your holes just right for your handles on the serving board so there kind of works like so so you get the feel for it all right i like to use the vix bits here uh, self-centering bit uh, and i'm testing it out on plywood gotta test it i've done a couple of these where i messed it up and then just verify, do your holes line up where you want it to? So make sure you test it on scrap wood before your actual piece. Uh, you might have to make it again. Uh, and then I'm just adding in a quick little screw here. The CA glue is great, but just for longevity, you're gonna add a screw for some more strength. All right, wrapping it up with the jig. So you take your jig, place it down, whether you clamp it or hold it in place, then I start, I do start with the VIX bit, that self-centering bit, so I don't lose the hole and, and damage it. I've done it other ways where I went straight to the bit and it just didn't work out as well. So this really just gets you a little hole. And then you go back with just a 1 8 inch drill bit and go all the way through. All right, so now I'm all the way through, but I need to have a uh, countersink. I need to have a space uh, for the head of the screw to attach the handle. So pick whichever side you want. And then um, here I'm going with a 3 8 inch Forstner bit, just a little bit, just enough where it's going to cover that head. Uh, so the head of the screw is going to sit below the board and that way it sits flat on the table. So that's your last step here with a, a countersink bit. All right, so go ahead and take your jig and line it up, center it on the board where you want the holes for the handles. And then using that self-centering bit, just go through to not damage the jig and you're getting that 1 8 inch uh, screw that comes through. Then switching over to the 1 8 inch drill bit just to go all the way through uh, and making sure you have a piece of scrap wood underneath to prevent tear out. Then I'm going to the drill press just to, to screw, <laughs> to drill out uh, the Forstner bit, just that recess for the, the screw head. You could use a hand drill, you don't have to use a drill press. On this, just be careful to line it up uh, for your uh, screw head. But you get a feel for what it looks like. Go ahead and just test the depth. Give yourself a little bit extra room there. You really wanna make sure that screw head, it sits beneath the board so it doesn't scuff up uh, any table. Again, I'm back with the CA glue. It just had some more voids, some more cracks uh, that showed up after surfacing. You wanna do this before any of your final sanding. It really does sand out really quick. So Starbon, CA glue, great stuff activator. All right, for sanding, I like to do 80 grit, then 120, then 150, then I raise the grain and do 220. So with the random orbital sander, really I just do random orbit up until 80 and 120, and then around 120 I start hand sanding. So I'll hand sand at 120, uh, and then I will hand sand at 150, and I like to hand sand the 150 before I random orbit the 150, because anytime you hand sand on the edges here, you're gonna leave some little scratches. And so uh, to finish with the random orbit, you can kind of get rid of most of that. So at 150, uh, I stop and I raise the grain. So I'm just using a spray bottle, this is just water. And what this does is it gets all those wood fibers, it, it raises, it makes it a little fuzzy. If this step didn't happen after all the sanding, you know, the recipient gets it, they wash their board, 
their board wouldn't be smooth anymore. It'd be fuzzy. So you just want to get it lightly wet. You don't need to soak it. You don't need to drench it. Got my two of my sons here helping me out. Uh, then you want to dry off most of that. It's, it's wet. It, it got where the water needed to go. And then just set the boards out. Let them dry slowly. Uh, don't speed up this process or your boards are going to warp on you and that would be awful. So nice and slow, uh, relatively cool temperature. And then uh, after they're dried, uh, then go with the 220. So 220, uh, hand sanding, get all those edges nice and easy. Again, you're trying to maintain that profile you made. And after the 220 hand sanding, finish off with 220 with the random orbital sander. Uh, light pressure, don't go too hard or you're gonna have to do the whole thing all over again. And that would be a bummer as far as the grain raising. All right, wood finish. Uh, here I am using Odie's oil. I talk a lot about the different options. Again, that cutting board 101 video, it's just a lot more in depth. Um, but here, Odie's oil is a great option because uh, it's similar to the mineral oil board wax option, but it's not gonna you know, leak out oil for days and it's, it's gonna be a pretty quick uh, pretty quick process and so um, it, you let it saturate it let it sit for you know an hour or so depending on what you want just not longer than 12 hours and then you got to buff it in so what's most important with Odie's oil or with other hard waxes you got to buff it you got to buff it in uh, using a buffer here pretty inexpensive and it really helps and it's a superior finish and you can already feel how great it is great protection and then for maintenance uh, you know the recipient can use normal board wax or mineral oil if they want, like they would with a cutting board. But it's a great option, plenty of other options. But here you get a feel for what the boards look like. Don't worry, beauty shots out in uh, natural light are, are coming. All right, screw heads. So the screws that come with my handles, I'm not a fan of, they, they strip uh, the head strips a lot. Uh, they're also not stainless. So I do buy some stainless screws that are about the same size. Uh, you know, the heads seem to last a little bit better. But with whatever screws you have, depending on the thickness of your board, you might need to shorten the screw. And so one option is just using a sander uh, with some vice grips here. Uh, you can just shorten them. Just be careful, it can't overheat. You can snap a screw, but this has really helped me get that perfect tight fit on boards before. So that's something to consider uh, if you're having some issues with the length of your screws based on your, uh, your thickness of your board. All right, so attaching the handles, plenty of ways. I like using the, the vise in my bench, uh, other ways, but I do recommend clamping, uh, clamping your handle in place and then just really carefully uh, screwing in uh, the screws attaching to the handles. Taking your time, uh, you can use a power drill, just take it nice and easy, nice and easy. You don't wanna strip those heads and you wanna make sure you have the alignment just so. With this, um, you know, I did use that 1 8 inch drill bit and these screws are a little bit wider. So you know, gotta take a little bit easier, but it works. Most important with the screws is making sure they get all the way in, got a nice tight handle, right? There's no gaps, it's gonna stay there. And then you wanna make sure that screw head is sitting below so it doesn't scratch up the table. I don't like to cover these with epoxy or fill them, that way they can be swapped out by the recipient uh, down the road. It uh, just gives more options. All right, here are the boards. Beautiful, gorgeous. Uh, the wood selection really makes a difference. So definitely consider that. Um, some more on the wood selection at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. All right, those were some beautiful boards. Before we wrap it up, before we get to the end, at the end, I am gonna talk about some wood selection, wood species, lots of other notes, so make sure you stick around for that. Use the timestamps if you just wanna skip ahead, but I wanna talk about sales. Uh, so if you are not in the side hustle or a, or a small business, if you don't care about sales, go ahead and just skip uh, on to, to the ending. But I wanna talk about pricing. And I like I said, I've sold quite a few of these boards. So they're beautiful, right? And so especially if I'm using uh, nice exotic hardwoods, right? This has black limba, paduke. It's got all kinds of really, really choice woods. I can sell it for 150 bucks, right, for this board. Um, now granted, where I'm at, my region, I've built my, you know, base for a long time. I got, you know, a bigger social media presence. So there's other variables in why I'm able to sell these for a little bit more, but I've actually sold a ton of these. I've sold quite a few. You can check my website to see some other ones, kind of in that, you know, 120 to 160 range, especially with these really, really nice woods. Now, where you're at, 
probably not going to be able to sell it for that price right off the get-go. And so you might have to work your way up. And so one thing I want to point out is while I love these serving boards, this whole video is about serving boards, it's a great project. What I did when I made this batch, they're also a little bulky with these handles for storage because sometimes I just want to hold on to have some inventory, is I took one of the pieces and here it's about, you know, the size is a little bit smaller. And instead of making this into one serving board that I could sell for, for 150, I'm gonna actually cut this into three different pieces. So right here, the width, it's about 12 inches wide. I'm gonna go, you know, seven-ish inches. And I'm gonna have three smaller cutting boards. Now take a look at this picture. Here you can see, here are some of these small boards that have a unique triangular handle grip, right? So I have a whole video on this, whole video on how to make this grip a cool jig repeatable, but that's a smaller board. And that smaller board, especially for those of you who are starting out and maybe don't have, you know, as big a client base or, you know, as many, you know, people with eyes on your products, that's a board you could sell for 60 to 80 bucks. Most people who buy my boards, the ones they use the most are the small ones, your everyday board. And so those are also an entry purchase for, for a lot of people who wanna support you, support what you're doing, but they don't wanna shell out $150 for all the different reasons. Again, there's a lot of pricing reasons why I sell mine for, for what I do. But, you know, taking that same piece, I could sell, you know, three boards at, let's say, let's say I just do 60 bucks. That's $180, right? Already it's a little bit more. Granted, it's a little bit more sanding and using the jig, it's a little bit more work, but material wise, it's about the same. And if you're someone who's like, yeah, I don't know that I can sell them for that much. You know, maybe I could sell this for 80, you know, if I'm lucky or a hundred, um, then maybe you do some, don't go all in. But I do love these. That's not to say, you know, this whole video was about the serving board. Now I say, don't make them to sell. I love them. They're a great project. But as far as sales, um, if you're struggling to find those, those higher end clients uh, or people to purchase, maybe set aside a couple and make some smaller boards. Just having a good mix uh, to diversify. Anyway, great boards, sales tips. Gonna have some more sales tips in coming videos, um, some other products that sell. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But yes, sales. Well, there you have it, serving boards. This is really what I do the most of, most of these types of projects. And so if you found value with this video and wanna see more content like this, please consider subscribing to see more like so. Uh, be sure to check those links uh, down below or just check the channel for some other videos uh, using traditional tools uh, to make some awesome projects. Uh, if you're curious about the woods I use and you wanna know more about these different wood species, be sure to check out that Wood 101 video. You know, use those timestamps to jump around just to see the different types of woods uh, that I use, these ones in particular, um, some considerations with using them, as well as where to find them. Some some great resources there to check out but uh serving boards got some more content like this with just traditional tools as you can see over here i do have a cnc this is newer to me and i've just been experimenting with all kinds of projects and so yes you got you know batching projects but then other projects going to start doing some more hardwoods here and lots of possibilities here so uh even if you're not into the cnc thing and you're skeptical i was myself uh, maybe i'll give you some ideas maybe change your mind or maybe you're already in the cnc game and you get some ideas there as well but it's not just cnc it's kind of a mix of it all uh but mostly i I do like to work with the hardwoods and use traditional tools. Blab, blab, blab. Thanks for sticking around. We'll catch you next time. Appreciate it.